Thank you very much for this kind uh, introduction. First of all, I would like to thank the Tartal organizing team for choosing my presentation for this seventh international conference of myth in the arts. Being talking my field of study, I do not dare to wish you a good afternoon, lest Kendall shows up and asks, what do I mean with that? <laughs> and invites lots of hungry dwarves for tea who trick me into signing a contract. So I suddenly find myself riding a pony with a cloak too big for me and even without a pocket handkerchief. My name is Monica Sanz Rodriguez and I'm going to tell you a story about the narrative form of fairy tales and the myths hidden in them filtered into Tolkien's work. As Carl Jung formulates in this quote, Mythological language is able to reflect in our fundamental mental images and talk to us in a way that no other rhetorical form can do. Fairy stories' relationships with the purest emotions and feelings, um, from happiness to horror, makes them a powerful conductor that connects our inmost part, no matter our age, our cultural level, or even our location in the world. Tolkien himself was a great admirer of the narrative form of fairy and mythological studies. Uh, in March the 8th, 1939, he offered a crucial lecture on the matter called On Fairy Stories. It was dedicated to Andrew Lang, one of the folklorists and compilers of fairy stories he knew the most, since he used to listen to and to read his red fairy book when he was a child. This lecture was also published, and along with the monsters and the critics, would be the most academically influential text by Tolkien. In the essay, we can find this bold statement about fairyland, Faeri, where he calls it the perilous realm. We are too accustomed nowadays to the sugary and harmless image of fairyland, but the original vision of this land was indeed full of pitfalls and dungeons. Tolkien applies this thought to his own works. Perhaps you might have read Smith of Wood of Mayer. In there, you will find lots of deeply disturbing and terrifying scenes when Tim is visiting Faerie. For example, when he sees the elven warrior's land. That is terrifying. Um, as Tolkien said in his lecture, this evil and fear are not tied to heaven or to hell but to a more primeval and atavistic source that we can also find in The Lord of the Rings. As Tolkien writes in his 1955 letter to Molly Waldron, cannot people imagine things hostile to men and hobbits who prey on them without being in league with the devil? He's talking here about the old man Willow, one of the characters of The Lord of the Rings, one of those rara avis who does not obey to Morgoth or Sauron. When the inquisitive readers face, oh, there we go. When the inquisitive readers find these characters, uh, they cannot help but wonder who they are and who they serve. Tolkien provided an answer in his 1954 letter to Naomi Mitchison. This is a very interesting letter. As a story, I think it is good that there should be a lot of things unexplained especially if an explanation actually exists. And even in a mythical age, there must be some enigmas, as there always are. In here, he's talking about one of the most famous characters in the Lord of the Rings for all the readers, who is Tom Bombadil. How many times people wonder, who is Tom Bombadil? He's an intentional enigma. In this presentation, I'm going to exemplify how the mythical language filters into Tolkien's narrative, but I will not do it the easy way. Instead, I would like to point out to a hidden monster that I have recently discovered, a supernatural creature coming from myth and born to perform evil deeds, who is not serving Morgoth nor Sauron, nor heaven nor hell, the greater foes, and is an utter and total enigma. It's even possible that Tolkien was not aware of this mythical leak into his legendarium. In order to find it, we must escape from the old man Willow, who is not in league with the devil, and follow old Jolly Tom Bombadil, created as an enigma on purpose. 
Now I have a question to make you. How many of you have read The Lord of the Rings? Good. <laughs> How many of you who haven't read The Lord of Rings know about Tom Bombadil? None, okay. <laughs> so, uh, here we are. This is a poem that Tom Bombadil sings when he's about to rescue the hobbits from the old man willow. And it starts like this. Old Tom Bombadil, what a little is bringing, comes hopping home again, can you hear him singing? Hey, come merry doll, derry doll and merry oh. Uh, who is he referring to? I think Martin would know that, that <laughs> he's talking. Okay, so he's referring to his own wife, called Berry. Many of you would wonder why this crazy lecturer points out at Goldberry, calling her a monster. She's a kind, fair and beaming woman, living in harmony with nature, loving her husband, serving meals made of milk and cream and honeycomb, singing at sunrise and doing so many more adorable things. Well, I will try to rest my case so the veil is lifted from your eyes and you will finally discover that under that beautiful shape, she's actually a flesh-eating monster. Goldberg is a pretty ancient character in Tolkien's literature. She appears in the poem, The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, that was originally published as early as February the 13th, 1934, at the Oxford English Magazine, volume 52. Tolkien included Bombard in, in The Lord of the Rings because he had already created the character and because he also needed the hobbits to go through an adventure before meeting with Trancos, with Strider in Bree. Um, including the poem in the book The Adventures of Tom Bombadil means that Tolkien introduced the rhymes into Hobbit lore since all the pieces present there are extracted from the Red Book of Westmarch. In the two poems where he appears, Tolkien comments, Tom's raillery is turned in jest upon his friends, who treated with amusement, tinked up with fear. In one of the stanzas, we find that Goldberry, supposedly playful, grabs Tom by the beard and sinks him into the river. There his beard dangled long down into the water, up came Goldberry, the river woman's daughter, pulled Tom's hanging hair, in he went to wallowing, under the water lilies, bubbling and a swallowing. The only way for Tom to save his life is to command her to, quote, go down, sleep again where the pools are shady, far below the willow roots, little water lady. This spell, in a different fashion, will be used by Tom for every foe he faces in the poem, the old man willow, the butter folk, and the barrow white, as well as in the Lord of the Rings, when he saves the hobbits from the old man willow, where he says, eat earth, dig deep, drink water, go to sleep. That is to say, Tom has to use his special and peculiar magic in order to escape from certain death. Thus, Colberry, whether she was playing or not, is in some ways similar to the other creatures of the poem. He even sends the barrow white to sleep like Coleman Willow, like young Goldberry and Butcher Folk in the barrow. Coincidentally, the barrow white is the only one among them who is, as Tolkien said, in league with the devil. But let us remember that the poem is far older than the story tying this creature with Sauron. Later in the poem, the idea of Tom escaping death is reinforced with another stanza. None ever caught old Tom in upland or in dingle, walking the forest paths or by the wither window, or out on the lily pools in boat upon, uh, upon the water. Goldberry is uh, later on the poem, uh, uh, Tom Bombadil abducts Goldberry and marries her, leaving his mo her mother, the river mo woman, sighing in grief. Goldberry is associated with water in many ways. She is called the river woman's daughter. She lives in a pool full of water lilies until Bombadil catches her. And later, Bombadil surrounds her with vessels full of water and those flowers. And as Tarin Jane Taylor reminds us in her essay investigating the role and origin of Goldberry, her footsteps are described as like a stream falling and her singing opens up pools and waters in the minds of the hobbits. 
We can find spooky mythological creatures who share some features with the Goldberry from the poem, who pulls Tom's beard in order to drown him. We could talk about the Bookaboo or Bookadoo from Cornwall. We can call, we can speak about the Scottish Yehushke, the Briton Mary Morgans, the Slavic Rusalkas, or even the Greek Naiads and Mermaids. Even Tolkien has some other water creatures in his legendarium, such as the water in the water or the mermaid like Oarnen. But those are not the monsters I am looking for. This gentleman with that impressive mustache is Andrew Lang. I have already mentioned him in this presentation. This Scottish writer was also a journalist, poet, Homer's translator, historian, and biographer, though for this presentation, we are more interested in his work as fairy stories compiler. Tolkien was in contact with his compilations since childhood and he mentioned the Red Fairy book stories as tales he knew and read when he was a child. Tolkien deeply respected his defense of myth as part, uh, part of history. At Andrew Lang's Green Fairy book, we find a tale called King Koyata of a Russian origin. In this history, King Koyata, who was unable to produce an heir, undertakes a long journey through his kingdom. On his way back, he feels a sudden and violent thirst for water, and he finds a crystalline pond where he plunges his head along with his astonishing long beard. But when he tries to stand again, uh, something grabs firmly his beard and threatens to drown him. This malignant creature promises to let go if he gives him the thing he will find in his palace that was not there when he left. And of course, as you may have already guessed, the queen has a child in absence of her husband. This is a familiar trope in fairy tales and fairy stories. Nevertheless, I intend to go further with my research. There is a creature of Slavic, German, and Northern origin which shares more characteristics with Goldberry than any creature mentioned earlier. Its name is Nokka, or more precisely, the name of its female counterpart, the Nyx. So what is a Nokka? A Nokka is a mythological creature who lives under fresh water, be it uh, rivers, streamlets, ponds, lake, or even wells. Um, they are regularly described as old men with long beards who live in solitude and are eager for human flesh. As a kind of counterpart, some of its feminine versions or nixes are very friendly, sociable, and keen on dancing and singing, although the majority of them cultivate the peculiar hobby of homicide and cannibalism. About this feminine counterpart of the Nokka, it is told that they have a captivating beauty. In the poem, when Tom is trapped by Goldberry, he cries, there's a pretty maiden. It is also said that they comb the long golden hair, as Goldberry, with her floating hair, does in the poem, combed her tresses yellow. They charm men with the voices, and we see her singing to the birds in the poem, and welcoming the hobbits with an enticing song in the novel. Finally, the benevolent ones frequently marry men. These two very elegant gentlemen are Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Apart from being compilers of traditional folk tales, they are renowned for their linguistic research, uh, reflected in the Seminal Etymological Dictionary. Their book, Children's Household Tales, was published at the end of 1820, and it brought them international renown and made their names immortal. Tolkien knew and admired Brothers Grimm both for their folktale compilations and their linguistic works, as well as for the research to study and compile Teutonic mythology. They are mentioned too on the essay on fairy stories, both in the final version and the manuscript preserved at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Amongst the Grimm Brothers tales, we find Nixes playing malignant roles slaving the unwary or dragging them under the water. In the tale number 81, The Nix of the Mill Pond, which Andrew Lang would include in his yellow fairy book under the title The Nix, Miller makes a deal with the Nix. 
She will give him wealth, and he will give her the first thing that is born in his home. He agrees, thinking of a puppy, a kitty, or a chick. But as you may have imagined now, the miller's wife had just given birth when he arrived home. In the tale number 79, the water nicks. This creature enslaves two poor children who fall in the, in the well she was living in. She gives them, them impossible tasks, such as fetching water in a bucket with a hole in it, or cutting a tree with a blunt axe in order to keep them at her service forever. But what is the crucial piece of this puzzle that makes me identify Goldberry with the knocker and no other creature? What is the clue, the final sign, that straightforwardly points to this premise? I have hinted it in previous slides, and you may have noticed it. There, my pretty lady is, river woman's daughter, slender as the willow wand, clearer than the water, autumn bombardil, water lilies bringing. When the hobbits meet Tom Bombadil, he's carefully carrying on a large leaf as on a tray a small pile of wild white water lilies. Uh, Don't you cross my lilies, says Tom when he puts them on the floor. The first thing we meet of Goldberry is her voice singing from the house, reeds by the shady pool, lilies on the water, old Tom Bombadil and the river daughter. And the first thing we see of her is this image and we contemplate her long yellow hair and a green dress with beads of dew, her waist surrounded by a belt of flag lilies and surrounded by water lilies. Tom described what he was doing when he found the hobbit says, I had an errand there gathering water lilies, green leaves and lilies white to please my pretty lady. The last are the year's end to keep them from the winter, to flower by her pretty feet till the snows are melted. These two references point out to Goldberry's need of these flowers until spring appears again and she will be able to bathe among the water lilies in the pond. In the poem, it's also mentioned that Goldberry wore on her wedding with Tom forget-me-nots and flag lilies for garland. The Nokken use water lily ponds as the dwellings in order to use the flower both as covering and as bait for their prey. We can check it by looking at this fantastic painting by Theodor Kittelsen. Nokken wait under water lilies, and when a lover passes by and marvels at the beauty of the flower, leaning over to collect it as a present for her lady, the Nokke pulls it, carrying the, lower, the lover underwater to feast on him. This creature receives many names depending on the region where it's found, such as Nikur at the Faroe Islands or Nika on the Netherlands, all of them related to the Proto-Indo-European root Naik, you have it over there, which is related to the topics of washing or cleaning, given that they live underwater, and also to the concept of nude, naked. Um, since many Nokken are naked and covered with their hair and all their beards in the legends. In Upper and Central Germany, they are called Hackermann, the one with the hook, because they use a hook to take people underwater. And uh, it, it even appears at the Beowulf. You have their uh, stanza, two stanzas, where the Nikeras is mentioned. Uh, in fact, Tolkien, in his translation of the Beowulf, he translated it as uh, water monster. The old, uh, this word can still be found in some places, some place names, uh, such as Nikapit, which is a forest in East Georgia, and also is related to the uh, concept of Old Nick, which is identified with um, uh, Father Christmas in England, but comes from Hjaldr Hnikar, one of the names of Odin. In Sweden, water lilies are called Necrosfexta, and in Norway, Nakkerosa, both names meaning lily of the Nokke. I have mentioned earlier that uh, um, Goldberry wore flag lilies in her wedding. There is one Swedish legend uh, of the birth of this kind of flowers, they are crimson. There once was a poor fisherman who lived by the Fogeton Lake among the trees of Tibetan. 
He had a beautiful daughter. The lake gave him little fish, so the fisherman barely provided for his small family. One day, while the fisherman was fishing in his small oak boat, he met the knocker, who offered plenty of fish from that moment on if he gave him, in exchange, his daughter when she became of age. The desperate fisherman agreed. The day the girl came of age, she went down to the bank of the lake to meet the knocker. He happily asked her to come with him to his underwater dwellings, but the girl unsheathed the knife and swore that he would never have her alive, stabbing herself in the heart and falling dead in the lake. Then her blood dyed the water lilies red, and since that day onward, most of the water lilies of the lake among the trees of Tibetan are red. Right now, Tibetan is protected. It's a national park, so no one can take the flag lilies. I suppose the knocker has moved to another place where he can hunt. Uh, the reverence that Tolkien professed to fairy stories and myths and his vast knowledge on the matter may have filtered drop by drop into his legendarium. Drop by drop it formed a puddle, and from that puddle a pool, and from that pool a lake. And in spring, nurtured by the professor's imagination and his tireless quill, the surface bloomed in spectacular and delicate water lilies, tied with invisible strings to this ancient, dark, and atavistic monster. Thank you very much. If you read the QR in there, you have my bibliography and also my, my links. Thank you very much. <laughs>